back to the podcast and welcome back to a returning guest. This is Jagdish Hadiangadi. Jagdish, welcome back. Hello, thank you for having me. So we've spoken twice before, uh, once about Francis Bacon and once about uh, the nature of problems. And today we're going to talk about a book of yours that's just come out. Uh, this is Francis Bacon's Skeptical Recipes for New Knowledge. You've been kind enough to send me a copy. And um, I guess as a start, I, I might open the floor up to you, not just to introduce the book, but introduce how you came about it, because some of this book is also explains your academic progression. You write in the book that um, you spent much of your academic career denying that induction was even possible. And of course, many Popperians will say, of course, it's not, and they'll tweak their ears. But you go on to show that, uh, or to say in the book that you had made a mistake for much of your academic life, and you came to this particular book and this particular idea quite late on. So I might yet open up your own journey and the book itself as a first question. Yeah, yes. Uh, to begin with my journey, uh, like any uh, philosopher of science today, I didn't think that a method or a set of recipes exist that allows us to make um, to conclude about generalities from, you might say, what we learn from experience. We can't learn from experience in that way. And that's not just held by Popperians, but also all students of QM and so on. And even the people who believe in uh, induction in the sense of probability theory, they thought, uh, if you read Reichenbach or Carnap, they thought that a hypothesis has to be proposed first before you can argue for it on the basis of probability. So they also, the whole philosophy of science is a subject in which you assume that the beginning of science is putting forward a hypothesis. And then when you test it, then you can have either confirmations or as Popper and UM and others think, mainly refutations. Then people are disagreed about how to understand this. Late in the 19th century, uh, in, well, early in the 19th century, it was pretty much decided that Baconian induction as a collection of recommendations uh, doesn't work. So people gave interpretations of Bacon, but the interpretations fell short of describing Baconian induction as a viable way of doing science. And my introduction to Bacon late in the 20th uh, century, la, uh, 25 or, 30 or so years ago, was a, a complete change in the way in which I began to interpret Bacon. I began to see Francis Bacon as a kind of skeptic, that he proposed a skeptical view of scientific method. And he was misunderstood all the way through the 19th and 20th century because people assumed that he couldn't be a skeptic. He must be something else. And a dogmatist, a metaphysician, um, a, an empiricist, mostly as an empiricist, and so on. And uh, I had a new interpretation of Bacon early in the, this century, 20 odd years ago, but I found that nobody would take it seriously. I tried to, in 2006, for instance, I read a paper at a conference invited by uh, John Norton. He organized the conference and he uh, must have appreciated my views. He invited me and the paper went well. And since then I've read the paper, read my papers, several of them, in a number of venues, but so on these in these venues, their papers went well. I had difficulty getting published, primarily because the Bacon scholars basically did not see that my my interpretation of Bacon was uh, up to up to par. It didn't seem to them that it was. Uh, a reasonable interpretation of Bacon. And that shocked me because there are so many interpretations of Bacon. Francis Bacon's work has been widely interpreted 
in different ways, that I was surprised that my uh, take on his writings was so off kilter that, they, that the leading journals didn't even see it worth giving it a, a chance. And then my question was, why is that so? And part of it is, of course, because we all interpret Bacon as a kind of empiricist. And my thesis is that he was never an empiricist. And it's a mistake to think of him as an empiricist. But that's hard to get around it. And the second reason why I thought I had difficulty getting my views across is because people have different ideas of what skepticism is. Some people think skepticism is essentially what Descartes did in his cogito argument. Some others think it's essentially what Hume did or Wittgenstein did or the Pironians did. If you're very learned and you know about that, you think of Pironian skepticism. But the idea that there are many different kinds of skepticism and that Bacon had a particular form of it seemed very hard to convince people. And um, my thesis about Bacon is that first of all, he was a skeptic of a certain kind, not a Cartesian skeptic, not a Pironian skeptic, but a certain skeptic of a certain kind, that this technique, this way of approaching facts skeptically was adopted by the Royal Society of London in a modified form that is extremely successful, giving us modern science or some parts of it. And finally, that it was forgotten. And so all our difficulties in philosophy of science, we have many difficulties in it. Uh, all our difficulties reflect to some extent the fact that we have forgotten Baconian method. So mm -hmm. it has four parts to it. Well, let's start with the obvious place that many people listen in. And I made this mistake reading your book. I had to go back and start again at one point. Um, you mentioned that, okay, let's talk about what is not, I suppose, is the best way to do this. This is not an Aristotelian type of induction, and this is not a logical type of induction that you're talking about. So I might get it open up and tell us uh, what it's not, because most people, as soon as they hear the word induction, they're going to have all these arguments that have been nicely tangled up inside their head for why particularly logical induction doesn't work. So um, I might get to shoot down just what it's not at the start here. Yes, that's the good way of put, putting it. Um, in Aristotle's case, he thought that if you go from particulars to generalities, that's induction. And he allowed, uh, he had this the theory of epagoge, of how we can go beyond uh, um, knowledge of particulars, but uh, and his solution to the problem is to assume a theory of forms, which he thought, following Plato, is the is the true description of metaphysical description of reality, and then using that, he supposed Aristotle supposed that we see the forms of things directly as we perceive them in things. And then we can generalize from it by a method of abstraction to work out, you might say, the true knowledge of things in the world, of the nature of things in the world. And this works fine. And if you, you notice that in the history of medieval science, both in Islam as well as in Christianity, Aristotle's theory was adopted by a great many scientists and was extremely successful in application uh, successful in the sense that it got widespread um, acquiescence. But the difficulty with his view is that he assumes the theory of forms. And the skeptics, the Pironian skeptics, for example, could challenge that, saying it's all right that if you assume there are forms, then you can explain how to have epagoge, as he proposes it. But how do you know there are forms in the first place? You can't know that by epagoge. So there is a difficulty here. Now, the logical form of induction, which is the modern form of it, where we un understand it in terms of probability theory, that came up in the 17th century because uh, René Descartes proposed 
uh, theory of, of knowledge in which he assumed that he could prove from, from a certain argument from his cogito what the first principles of natural philosophy are. And he went on to actually enunciate his natural philosophy and attempted to show that it is uh, the, the true natural philosophy in his book, The Principles of Philosophy. But then he discovered that there's a gap between these principles and any description of the world which you try and understand in terms of it. Given any principles, there are many different models to understand the physical universe. In modern philosophy of science, we say that it's not enough to have a general theory, let's say a law of nature, a law-like statement. You also need initial conditions. And that was discovered by Descartes. Your general principles by themselves don't apply to uh, objects, but you can, you might say, uh, apply them if you had a model. But this model that you have to use to apply to a theory to things turns out to be difficult to obtain. There are too many of them, and you don't know which one is right. So Descartes took the view, and if you find it expressed in all his writings, that it really doesn't matter which model you choose. The important thing is to, to use the model to see how the principles manifest themselves in the particular. So he even put forward the view that you may know that your model is mistaken, that your hypothesis about things is mistaken, provided that it makes sense, that, uh, that you can make sense of particulars based on your principles, that's fine. So in the principle of philosophy, he gives a theory of motion, which assumes that God put motion in the universe. And that quantity of motion can neither be uh, uh, created nor destroyed by us. Only God could do it. And then he goes on to say, we know that's not how it happened, but it doesn't matter because it gives us a very good understanding of, you might say, the large scale phenomenon of motion in the universe. Now, this was unsatisfactory for many of Descartes' contemporaries. So in the latter part of the, in the middle of the um, 17th century after Descartes died, people started looking for ways to bridge the gap between the principles, which you know on mathematical grounds, they thought, and the facts which were established on the basis of sensory phenomena, on the basis of sensory uh, knowledge. And this gap was proposed by, uh, this gap was supposed to be solved in an interesting way. They said, well, we don't know what the true model is uh, because there are many possible, but if there is a way of grading them, we could choose the best. And then that would be a way of establishing a particular model out of many as the right one to adopt. And so Christian Huygens published, uh, well, he his view was published um, on the probability theory um, that would take us from particulars to the generalities. And it turns out that he actually was uh, relaying some results from Pascal uh, and from Fermat. So these three people developed this theory of probability. That has not been successful. Um, and I mean, that's another story. And, you know, I don't go in much into that because it would take me too far afield from my uh, intention of explaining Bacon's view. But now you see these two theories, the probability theory of induction and the epagoge as um, um, Aristotle called it, they both make assumptions which a skeptic would deny. That's the problem with all of them is that you always rely on some assumption and it doesn't stand up to skepticism. Now, what Bacon does is to show how starting with a pure skepticism that you are, all you're doing is refuting. You don't assume, assume anything or you don't assume it on a permanent basis. You assume it for the sake of an argument and then knock it down, knock down the assumption. 
that on this basis, you can still make discoveries of a general principle. That's the trick. That's Bacon's, Francis Bacon's great achievement is to show how using the elenchus, the method that Socrates used to question people's beliefs, how using the method of elenchus dialectically, so to speak, you can nevertheless extract from it an affirmative a piece of knowledge of a general principle. That was his great discovery. And that's what people used when they said they're doing experimental philosophy in the 1760s after the Royal Society of London was set up. That's what Boyle writes about. That's what Newton talks about in his Principia that he, in the second edition, he says that this he describes in the general scolium that his work is an example of uh, experimental philosophy in which one does not feign hypotheses. That's a famous quote. This is what they're getting at, that it's a method that does not depend on assumptions. So I'm sure listeners uh, hearing that will think to themselves, so how do we do this? How do we build this thing up? I know Bacon starts with, um, or uses the, the phrase that building natural histories. And you said just before that Bacon shows how this can all be done and how it can build up. So how does it actually happen? How does it, how, where do you start? What constitutes evidence? And um, if, as, as you say, Bacon is a fallibilist, a fallibilist all the way through. Well, what constitutes a refutation, for example? I know, I know I've thrown in um, some, you know, a, a lot of content there in that question, but people listening no, no, will, will, will pro- they'll probably be thinking, um, how, how does this work out in reality if someone was to begin trying to use Bacon's method? Well, let's go back to look at Aristotle because that's how Bacon introduces his friends. And Bacon was a, a very learned man and he talked about Aristotle a lot. So let's begin with Aristotle. Okay. So botany, let's say you do botany. And in the Middle East, medieval times when scholastics adopted uh, more or less an Aristotelian view, you collect flowers, let's say. And you want to know for each species which flower is appropriate to it. Now, what you can do is go to a meadow and collect flowers of different kinds which you recognize. But you would take flowers which are moth-eaten or insect-bitten or which are wilted or so on. What you do is you look for a specimen which you might say manifests its nature of that uh, plant as well as as it does. Then you can save it, dry it, put it in a book, write a little note on it, right? And that's a natural history of a range of flowers that you may have collected, let's say, from a, from a meadow. Mm-hmm. Now, what Bacon points out is that this natural history is too limited because it assumes that you already know what the form is and you choose your, you choose your uh, specimen based on what you think you know. And that's why he calls, he would regard this as an example of uh, uh, the kind of science that depends on the anticipations of the mind. Your mind already anticipates what is a good flower, and then you collect the flower, and then you put it in your book, uh, dry it up. And then subsequent people look at this book, and they understand from your descriptions and from the uh, dried flower what uh, it look like, and they find more examples of it. And you never get out of the cycle of um, the supposed knowledge that you have. As opposed to this, what Bacon suggests is that whenever you find that uh, a flower which exhibits a certain nature, you should look for flowers that don't exhibit the nature. Look for similar flowers which have some inexplicable difference. So not because they are eaten up by a, an insect or because they are um, badly nourished, they're not in the water or because they've been trampled upon, but they've grown in their natural way, but they show something which the original flower that you had in your book does not have. Now you see that uh, you, your argument that I see the nature of this flower in this book is 
undercut by the discovery of another flower, which seems to have a slightly different nature, but it belongs to the same species. It's the same kind of thing. And this, he, this is, uh, you might say, Francis Bacon's way of uh, interpreting the Socratic Elenchus. That's the difficult part to see. That is Socratic Elenchus. Socrates would go and pe ask people, what kind of a thing is courage? And as soon as they gave you their answer, he would say, yes, but what about this or what about that? And they would be uh, in difficulty. Or he would ask, what, what do you think about uh, Sophrosyne? And then, you know, a similar sort of argument would follow. The fact that the fact that uh, all these definitions fail, according to Bacon, is also true of natural philosophy, that natural philosophy too, our assumptions about what the true nature of a thing is, is faulty. And so what we need to do is do a kind of natural and experimental history. The experimental part being this way of challenging the belief in the true nature of a thing by finding something which is not quite of the same nature. And yet it is clearly um, related to the thing. And so then uh, now going from botany to in a general sort of way, all the forms that we perceive in the world, uh, according to scholastics, he thinks are poorly gathered in this way, not paying attention to all the difficulty. If we had all these difficulties worked out, then Francis Bacon thought you would have a much better understanding of the true forms of things are. Of course, there's a question of how do we get to the true form of things? And that's the second part of my view. Mm. Well, I was just going to ask actually before you said that, um, that sounds, if you go back to the flowers before we get to the second part, um, it sounds like a boundless process. There can always be another flower, a, another field, another discovery. Is there, a, is there an end point in this? Is there certainty at some point? Many people, of course, will associate induction, perhaps this is the traditional kind with certainty or a discovery of certainty. But this, as you described there, sounds like a, a permanently ongoing process. Yes. This is, of course, the main difficulty. So there has to be some form of closure, as they call it today in uh, the sociology of science. Where is the closure? You keep questioning, you keep challenging. Where's the closure, right? Mm. And for this, Francis Bacon thought that you do something called the interpretation of nature. And the trick is this. You do your natural history, experimental and natural history, and what you do is you collect a range of deviances from the nature that you accepted, uh, expected. These deviant cases are then written up as an experimental or natural history. You have, in effect, multiple paradoxes. That's the way of putting it. Since a thing can only have one nature, if it shows two nature, it's a paradox, right? Mm. If that paradox is repeated, not exactly, but uh, in multiple ways for the same thing that you're studying, then you get to the point where you, you have a, an enigmatic puzzle. Now, you can continue doing this forever, but at some point, you reach the case where nothing can explain the paradoxes that you've collected, the discrepancies that you've collected by any simple model. And at this point, you realize that it's your mind which is giving up, that somehow you have to give up some assumptions you make in order to get the proper model of the things you're studying. The reason why you can't have a model of all these different discrepancies is because you're making assumptions which are mistaken. These are the idols of the mind. You know, that's what he calls the idols, what Plato called idola in his later writings. The idola or the idols have to be shed for us to get at the models of reality. And once you get rid of the right idol, we have to find which one it is, then all of a sudden, all these different natures make sense. You can see why in different circumstances, you see a different nature for a thing that you're studying. That's the general idea. Now, the second part 
the second part, but the part in which you decipher or you interpret the true nature of a thing, he thought of it as, that's Francis Bacon thought of it as a kind of um, uh, something he did as a young man, namely a, de a, 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 a decryption of an encrypted message. Uh, in several places he says, that it's as if God is playing hide and seek with you in the manner of a child, and you are able to guess where things are hidden. And then when you have that, when you guess it, then you have enlightenment. You see things as they truly are. So that's his picture, that it's an encrypted message, an encoded message. Uh, you know, as a young man, he went to France and worked with, um, with the French, uh, with the English embassy in France, or the equivalent, the English uh, embassy with uh, Sir Amy, uh, Amias, uh, um, um, uh, he was he was recruited by Walsingham, Lord Walsingham, and his job was to was to decipher messages which were going through, and also to send messages that were encrypted. So he was very uh, excited by this technique of encryption and decryption which he was involved in, and that's when he I think he got his idea that perhaps to decipher the true nature of things is like deciphering God's true meaning, which he hasn't given us. He's a very uh, religious man, and he thought that uh, whereas God's ethics was given to us in the Old and the New Testaments, in, the, in, the, in Scripture, God's uh, message about natural things is not given to us in the same way. But we have the wherewithal to work out the true nature, if only we put our mind to, uh, to removing the barriers which pre prevent us from seeing the true nature, which we get by doing in, 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 by deciphering the encryption of nature in our evidence. How do we get to that encryption of nature? So um, if we move from that natural history um, that, um, that, we, that we start with the building up of flowers, and then we move to the interpretation of nature and the ideas we have about it and how they're forming and how they push us in certain ways. Um, isn't, um, and of course, you know, the first step, you could have endless uh, um, amounts of new discoveries, but isn't there an endless amount of new discoveries also in the interpretation of nature? Once you've just, once you question your own mind and how you're viewing what a flower should be or what it should look like. Isn't that also an endless uh, vista as well of possibilities? So how might we get from that to that final stage of decoding the puzzle? Well, here's the thing. If you start with, uh, if you start studying uh, anything uh, which uh, uh, interests you, you keep developing, you might say, an experimental and natural history, and it may lead nowhere. There is no guarantee that if you have an experimental and natural history, it will you will end up with an answer. But if you're lucky, then your experimental and natural history may give you a collection of um, paradoxes, if you want to call it, discrepancies of nature, which are such that they have a unique solution. That particular group, if you don't ask the question, what is the ultimate nature of reality? Is it ultimately one or many? You don't ask whether it is mathematical or qualitative. These are big questions. Mm. And Francis Bacon thinks eventually we could answer all of them. But for the time being, you ask, how is it that these phenomena, which are discrepant, have exactly those discrepancies? Why is it that the thing which appears so in one situation appears slightly different in another. Uh, very uh, similar situation. And as soon as you think of that very limited sort of question, then the collection of discrepancies you have become like a, a puzzle to which there is a very local solution, a local solution just about those things, not about the general metaphysics of all of reality, 
but just of the things that you're studying. And if you work out a model for that, and if that model turns out to be unique, nothing else will fit. Those phenomena, let's say you have eight phenomena, and to follow those eight phenomena, this is the only thing which works. Every other attempt to solve it fails. Then you have, in effect, discovered a small bit of reality, of, you might say a metaphysical description of nature, which, while it's fallible, is at least you know that it is, uh, you might say it, it is real because, and here's an explanation for that, because it will give you power over nature. This, when you do this, he says, you get power over nature. That power over nature, he's called it like a pledge of truth. Now you know that, you are, that what you are talking about is not a general description like Aristotle's description of forms or like... Uh, an atomist description of, uh, of the structure of reality. All these are ideas, words, and you, know, you don't know how it uh, applies to phenomena, to things as you perceive them. With this method, he thought, that when you find the model that works, it gives you power of a nature, because in all those circumstances when things appear uh, one way or another, your model explains them. So if you want to create a certain effect, you just produce the conditions under which it's observed, and then you get the effect. So you get power of nature. So as he puts it, you know that this is a description. You got hold of the thing itself in your description. You're not just talking uh, over it, but it's a description of the thing itself. How do we accept, so do we, um... So I'm not sure how to phrase this question exactly. I, I, how is he different from Popper? So I, 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 I might phrase this differently here. So uh, at parts reading this, I thought he sounded very Popperian. And at parts reading, I thought, oh, no, he doesn't. And But you could imagine all of those things you said there potentially sounding Popperian in a way. You start building, you 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 decide with a, with a conjecture to go and pick some flowers. You then start creating natural history, which Popper will call a test and see if the flowers fit your idea of what that conjecture should look like. And then <clears throat> you later criticize both the what you've both the experiment you've done, but also the conjectures you've had. And then you fall upon a, a final I, a idea, but you only accept that idea as being true um, um, because it is the best remaining explanation, not because you are convinced that it actually is, ha actually has hit truth. It may be completely wrong as well. So when Bacon says you have discovered something which gives you power over nature, is he talking that, uh, is he talking in a Popperian way here? Um, is it a conventionally true kind of statement, even though Popper would not like the word conventionally true? But um, how does he understand that word true? Well, here, when, when uh, Francis Bacon uses the word true and real, he means the classical Greek sense, true meaning uh, faithful to reality. It's true in the sense that there's a reality there, and your, your uh, model, your schematism of the phenomena is reflects something about that reality. Now, you may not get it exactly right, and uh, this is how Francis Bacon proposes it, is that if you have, let's say you start a, a collection of, uh, uh, you get some people together, and they start collecting natural histories like this, and each one takes a different topic. Then once you get a whole bunch of them, they're at the lowest level of understanding. It may turn out that what one person discovers about flowers and another person who discovers about roots of plants give you a discrepancy at another level. It doesn't follow that because you've got something which is a unique solution to a collection of uh, discrepancies. Therefore, it is exactly true. You've got all the thing. You've got something about the nature of the object but it might still be misleading. You might be making an assumption that is still misleading you in some way. You're seeing it slightly differently. Mm. It is truly. So then he suggests that at a second level, you have more inductions of this kind. 
by induction, we mean this kind of Socratic elenkers. We question what we thought we found, and then we go higher and higher, and we go up a pyramid until we get to the top. That's his idea. So it's fallible all the way until you get to the top, and then you have at the top, we never get to the top, but uh, I'll explain why in a minute. But the um, if you went this way and went all the way to the top, then you would have the only description of the reality of things, the true reality of things, and in full generality, because every other metaphysical scheme would be found to contradict something or the other that we have discovered, some of the phenomena that we've given. Mm. So the whole idea of uh, the Baconian method of induction is a theory of knowledge, which he doesn't enunciate, but we see it in the way in which he proposes it, which I would describe as follows. When you have uh, a hypothesis or a claim, and you want to know whether it's true or false, you can ask one of two things, is it well-founded? But then the question becomes, well, what about the foundation of the foundation? And that makes it difficult. The other is to say, does it fit with the rest of our knowledge? And that's also unsatisfactory because, of course, there are many different systems of knowledge. And while one doctrine may fit with one system of knowledge, another one fits fit with another system of knowledge, and they may contradict each other, and you don't want to say because they are coherent with some system of knowledge, therefore they're true, because you end up by saying two contradictory statements are both true. Right? Mm -hmm. So now, Bacon's solution to this, or implicit in his writings, is that when you have a collection of discrepancies in nature, your model is special because every other possible model fails. Mm. Yeah. Now, once, you see, once you find that every other possible model fails, then you have, you might say, a coherence theory of knowledge, yep. in which incoherence, the incoherence of other points of view, recommends a particular uh, model to you. And that's his theory of knowledge, implicit in his theory of induction. He doesn't state it that way. That's my... Uh, gloss on it is your foundation you you said the problem with foundationalism is of course there's always that problem of what is the foundation of the foundation um but in some of the reading of bacon i i got the impression reading that he was a foundationalist now i'm probably wrong about that of course i'll hand it over to you here but um it, is he i suppose is he a foundationalist and um how do we start building these um this ladder or this pyramid of knowledge? If we can never be sure that we're at the top, can we ever be sure we're at the bottom? Well, he's not a foundationalist because given any foundation, he asks you to use a Socratic el elenchus on it. So let us suppose we start with a foundation of facts, revealing instances. We ask what is the nature of heat and we look at revealing instances, those things which reveal to us the true nature of heat. Now you start with that and you write them down. And then what he suggests is you question it, say, does something actually have those properties and nevertheless not be heat? Or something which is heat but does not have those natural properties. You know, this is very abstract when mm. uh, Bacon describes it. It's useful to look at a case. One of the followers of uh, Francis Bacon's method was Robert Boyle who was a chemist, uh, uh, an alchemist and a chemist and a physicist. And he modified Bacon's, improved Bacon's uh, method by marrying it with um, the mechanical philosophy in a certain way. But look at one of his instances. He was, uh, Francis Bacon was uh, a great admirer of uh, uh, the, uh, he was in fact, you might say a methodologist of chemist. He was, a, he was a chemical methodologist. His whole theory is about chemistry. And Robert Boyle follows him in that. And it's only with Newton that the scientific method became connected more with physics than with chemistry. But uh, in his chemical studies, one of the questions that 
uh, everyone was interested in those days was what makes life special? What is the chemical which makes life special? And they thought there was an elixir of life, which if you took, you would get, um, you would uh, escape death. Um, the, the, the question was, what is the foundation of it? And the one alchemist who thought that he had this thing and he came and gave a demonstration of it. And the demonstration was to take a substance and show that it glows in the dark. And he said, this is what I, I got all this from human, um, from uh, human um, tissues and see, underlying all that is this beautiful glow and it's this glow which makes for life. But he wouldn't say how he got it. He wouldn't mm. say how he this. And then Robert Boyle, of course, is intrigued. He wants to know how they, he got it. So he suggests that perhaps it could either come from blood or from urine. And he decided that he was going to take urine of various, uh, not just human, but urine, and boil it down and see if he can come to this essence. And eventually he comes to it. He finds if you boil down urine enough, then what's left over will glow in the dark, exactly as this alchemist had said. But now comes the second part. He doesn't want to accept the view that this is life, this is the foundation of life. He wants to question it. Does it always glow what its properties are? And so one of his assistants start, he and his assistants start working on the natural properties of the substance that they found. And so they start asking, is it, what are its properties? Is it hot? Is it cold? Etc. One of the things that glows in the dark and the question becomes, is it hot? Most things which glow are hot. And they find that to the touch, it is cold. Mm. But one of his assistants, of course, you don't touch with the finger, you use a knife or a, uh, wiped the knife on his coat, on his jacket, which was a lab jacket, probably of some kind, which he wore in the lab. And what he found to his surprise at the end of the day, that where he had rubbed it, there was a burn mark. Now, this is the sort of thing that Bacon says, don't throw it away. This is what you have. And he writes it down. Is it hot or is it cold? And he discovers that if you rub it, it has a certain kind of heat. But if you don't rub it, then it's, then it's not hot. Mm. And um, from this, Uh, it's an interesting thing. The power of an, I mean, there's an elaborate description of all its properties, which I, is a, is another story. But uh, one of the things that comes out of this is that if you take a piece of wood, a small stick, and you dip it in sulfur so that it uh, will carry a flame, but sulfur is very hard to light up. You have to first light it up. So what you do is you take the substance and you put it on the tip and you rub it and it creates the heat which then gives you the stick lighting up. What we have, what I've just described to you is the safety match. Mm. And that was discovered by Robert Boyle. Investigating the properties of this funny thing, which is the foundation of all, what he has discovered, of course, is phosphorus. That was discovered many years later. So uh, you see how you go from valuing discrepant properties, strange properties, and writing them down and investigating them to getting an idea of the nature of an object. You may not get it entirely, but you get partly. And then how it leads, you might say, to power of a nature, to a, eventually to a safety matchstick. Mm. It you, I don't have it in front of me here, but I think you called it the uh, the Baconian fallacy of acting too soon. And um, so this is certainly something that that, that seems to differ from um, well, at least many people with modern understanding of science, or at least Popperian science. And that is, um, you write that uh, often we are simply when we discover a discrepancy. We're too quick to act. We're too quick to move. We're too quick to accept the, the uh, discrepancy. And I, I, I might explain why that is a problem here, but I'm assuming it's because Bacon wants us to keep building and building and building and building rather than throwing something away, which may be valuable. 
Well, you don't. You can throw away those things which don't create discrepancies. But if you find a paradox, you save it. Mm. So what he has asked you to say about all those things which create trouble for you, that's what you collect. And uh, the the discovery that he makes is that philosophers who take one discrepancy at a time and knock it off, finding an excuse or a reason for knocking it off, will find that whatever they started off with is the truth. They'll find that they're never wrong because you can always find a way of explaining away a feature of the world that is inconvenient. And that's very much like Popper. There, uh, so there is a, in the mid eighties, Peter Erbach wrote a very uh, thorough reading of uh, Bacon, a good reading of Bacon in which it says that Francis Bacon was uh, a, a predecessor. He, he, forced, he foresaw a Popperian method of so, I mean, He was not entirely Popperian, but he followed that uh, Popper's view is foreshadowed in of Bacon's, Francis Bacon's writings. And I think he's right about that. The main difference between Popper and UM and all the moderns is that they take a refutation as a single point of contrast between a theory and fact. So if you have given a theory and a fact and the fact refutes it, then the analysis, the logical analysis is given only of the one theory and the one fact, and you ask, how should you treat the fact uh, if it's a refuting fact? And I agree with Popper that on the hypothetical or deductive model, as it's called, if you have a theory and it's refuted, then if you're interested in finding out about the world, not just in um, looking good, then you can't dismiss the fact. You must respect it. And although there may be ways of showing that it's some auxiliary hypothesis used in the deduction of that fact from that theory, uh, which you can blame, nevertheless, your interest must be to find out if the theory is in fact false. So it's like a Popper's theory is like a recommendation of how to proceed in science. And I, I still think that that's, in, if you use the hypothetical deductive method, that's the best advice you can get. Try hard to find out where you're mistaken. Don't waste your time trying to save theories. Look to see where you're mistaken. And that, I think that on that point, uh, Francis Bacon would agree. The differences in the analysis, what Bacon talks about is how a theory relates to multiple breakdowns, many failures. And that's something that um, it is not there in the modern philosophy of science. Who talks about the multiple failures of a theory? And it turns out that when a theory has multiple failures, you forget the theory, you just now look at all these multiple failures and say, well, what's really happening here? Forget about the theory. And that's the inductive part. Does you it have, have hmm. sorry. I was just going to say, does it have similarities then to like a Lakatosian research uh, program then? Well, uh, all of these uh, Lakatosian research program is also a, a variation of the method of hypothesis. Mm. See, there are two methods which uh, Plato talks about. It's good to talk about Plato here because yeah. as a young man, Plato followed Socrates and he thought Socrates had this clever technique of asking difficult questions and Although he had no knowledge, he could somehow generate knowledge in his interlocutors, like a how, like a like a um, um, midwife who could give birth to help a woman to give birth, even if now the midwife is too old to have any children of her own. In Socrates' case, he never had the ability to have knowledge. He was a skeptic, but his skeptical questions he thought gave people knowledge. And Plato couldn't see how it was done. He wrote a dialogue called uh, the Gorgias, mm. in which uh, he shows, and I'm indebted to Gregory Vlastos for showing me this, that he essentially argues that to show that something is true on the basis of a method of the method of Elenchus, 
you have to show by the method of Filenkas that every other alternative is false. And that's too much. Let us suppose that uh, one person is a Buddhist and another person is, let's say, Muslim. Then wisdom consists in showing that Buddhism is correct or Islam is correct because every version of Buddhism is self inconsistent. That's too much to show. Mm. Wisdom requires that I have to show everybody is inconsistent. And so after the Gorgias, Plato asked, well, how then did it happen? How does Socrates do it? And he invents a whole philosophy to try and answer it. That's the story of his mm. life. Uh, but what he does in effect is to say that what is right is that the method of the Elenchus, the uh, method of uh, hypothesis, the method of uh, challenging should be married to the method of hypothesis. In the Elenchus, Socratic Elenchus, you question what people's deepest beliefs are. That's how he, uh, that's mm. how he works. He asks a general about what uh, courage is and so on. The people who um, must know what they're talking about. In the method of hypothesis, you have no special interest in that hypothesis. You don't claim to know it. You just speculate. And he was interested in this uh, method. And he found to his, surprise, uh, to his surprise that there was a science in which this method was used and the Socratic Elenchus was used. That's in mathematics. So after that, he became very interested all his life in mathematics because they had what we today call the reductio ad absurdum which you assume something and uh, as a possibility and show that it's false after making a couple of uh, other assumptions. And in this way, you refute it. And then you, the negation then becomes a principle. The trouble is that in mathematics, the negation of a general principle may also be an interesting mathematical theory. Yeah. But that doesn't always work in the other subjects. And I think Plato struggled all his life to find out how Socrates did it, and he failed. He couldn't. And it's Francis Bacon who finds out how you do it. What you do is you don't talk about the most general things that interest you. You take a very small topic, find enough discrepancies that nothing works. And then you find out why is it that nothing seems to work? And it must be because something you're assuming about the phenomena you're studying, the way you're describing them, is a mistake. We have to get rid of that idol, and then we see, you might say, how the model truly works. Now, what happens if you take a subject like physics? And now I'm coming to the question of how do you deal with this quest, the question of uh, endless, this, you know, how do you stop the yeah. endless study of things? You just preempted me. Yeah, good. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah, that's the yeah. issue. Take a uh, journal like Physical Review. Every year you get multiple volumes of it coming out. Different people are writing different stuff, things. The same phenomena is uh, given multiple models. They show that the other person model doesn't work. Difficulties of it. It's, a, it's packed with difficulty. That is, you might say, multiple... Um, experimental natural histories put together every year. Now, there are some people in there who are only producing the difficulties. And there are other people in there who are only theoreticians. That's all they do is they look at all these things and try and make sense of them. And now you see that the solution to this problem of endless uh, production of research is that if you separate the researchers into particular, into the people who investigate phenomena, produce the discrepancies, from the theoreticians who try and solve it, then this is what uh, Francis Bacon suggests in his, uh, uh, in his description of Solomon's house, one of his, uh, one of his, uh, 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 ideas about how to proceed. And if you separate the theoretician from the uh, experimentalist, the experimentalist can keep producing. But when it reaches a critical point, the theoretician can take it over and say, look, 
For all the stuff that you have so far collected, I have a model which works extremely well and nothing else works. And all of a sudden, there's, you might say, uh, 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 kind of illumination of the whole subject, which then both the theoretician and the uh, experimenter have to pay attention. That's the idea that you don't solve the problem of how, when do you stop? Instead, one group continues finding that the experimental philosopher continues looking for difficulties. As soon as you put forward a point of view and it shows great, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you, you might say you understand how a certain theory works, the experimenter doesn't stop. They just proceed by questioning what you've just discovered. So closure only comes socially? No, no. So closure comes each time you solve each time you find a model that is a unique solution, oh, okay. closure. Mm. the closure comes from the theoretician. So uh, if you take uh, the study of colors, which is which I give an, ex an example at the end. Let's yeah, see. yeah, please. Yeah, go on. I was uh, going to end on that, but we should jump into it now. Yeah, go. So this is a good example, actually. I was going to save it to the end, but we should jump in with it just now. So um, this is a good example of how it how it works. So please go. Yes, so the theory of colors was proposed, uh, the difficulties with colors, all the discrepancies were noted by Robert Hooke in his Micrographia. They were also noted, uh, more of them were noted by Robert Boyle in his theory of uh, on the on qualities of colors. There's a, uh, then the people like Grimaldi and uh, uh, all the writings of the Cartesians on color, there's a whole collection of difficulties about color. And it goes all over the place. You don't know what to make of it. When Isaac Newton takes up the problem of color, he doesn't address the problem of color at all. He takes up an issue which is unrelated, apparently, to the problem of color. It turns out to be related in the facts of the case. But what interests him is a geometrical difficulty. The geometrical difficulty is that when light comes in through a small aperture, which is circular in nature in a darkened room, and this light, when it goes through a prism of any kind, uh, will, or will give you an image. And if you arrange the image the screens properly and in the right uh, way, you can calculate geometrically that you should get a circular image at a certain point. But astonishingly enough, what you get is an oblong image, considerably many times larger in the uh, vertical direction than in the horizontal. And that question then becomes, why is geometry failing us? We have Descartes' theory of uh, the, um, um, the sine law of refraction, and that seems to work pretty well. You've tried it out. You, Isaac Newton had tried it out and knew that it worked reasonably well. And yet you use that principle together with the geometry of light and you get a strange shape. So then uh, Newton does this experimental thing of changing all sorts of factors to see what could, what could uh, 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 you might say, collect a series of... Now, this uh, collection of uh, um, experiments that he does can be thought of in a Popperian analysis as a refutation, you might say, of some assumptions made by Descartes. But which assumptions? We don't know. Because he's just working with the facts. So he tries out various hypotheses and he shows that they're mistaken. But at the end of it, he discovers that none of these hypotheses can exp explain all the facts. There's nothing which will explain all the facts until you notice that, until he notices that the oblong image can be produced by a series of circular images, each one being a different color. So you have, instead of a circular, uh, you have a uh, uh, circular bit of uh, light, which is yellow, and another circular bit of light, which is red, but the two don't come at the same point. And so the spectrum then looks to you like a 
like a series of circular um, images, which together give you an oblong image. And from this, he concludes that what's happening with light is that with the prism, the, the, the uh, refrangibility, the refractive, the ability to refract is different for different kinds of light. And each one of them is a color. And in this way, he suddenly gets an entirely new way of looking at colors. And then he goes on and starts thinking about colors using his idea that uh, light, the colored light has different refrangibility. Each color has its own refrangibility. So then the question becomes, why are they, you know, the, now the whole new field of color phenomena has opened up to Newton, which he, which he investigates. Um, now, here is an example of how the, the idea that light uh, is a um, mixture of colors and that the colors don't blend into one another, but remain uh, independent of one another in, a, in white light. And that white light doesn't actually exist in reality. That what exists in reality are the various colors which are mixed in a certain proportion. The one way of testing that is to say, find the proportion make a wheel in which all these colors appear and spin it fast. And lo and behold, you get white light. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, Newton's, uh, now that is an example of how, for a very limited thing, it doesn't mean you know the light is a wave or a particle. It, it doesn't mean you know about why the colors don't mix in light. It doesn't mean you know there are all sorts of things about colors and uh, perceptions of them, which we don't know. And Newton even admits that how our mind perceives color is too difficult for him to know. He doesn't have enough experiments to do that work, so he leaves it aside. So there's lots about color we don't know. But for the limited set of facts that are given to him, that he works out and that he finds in uh, uh, the other writings, he has a solution which to this little bit of problem to which nothing else seems to work. So I'll take an example and you'll see how he can explain things. His mm -hmm. theory is that light, uh, when it, uh, um, that the, uh, one, of the one of the discrepancies that was found in light is this remarkable thing that was discovered by uh, Robert Hooke, that if you take a flask of, um, a uh, flask with the colored water, say blue, and another flask of colored water, say red. Then if you put the red, the first put the blue uh, in front of the uh, an aperture in a darkened room, all the light will appear blue. If you put the red, all the light will appear red. So if you combine them and put the blue and the red together, you would expect that light would come out purple because you mix red and blue and you get some form, some shade of purple. It doesn't. What happens is the room becomes dark. Now, this is explained in on Newton's theory very easily because for Newton, uh, the red is simply those, uh, red color, uh, on a, it simply is a color which is left after all the other colors of the spectrum, all the other components are reflected. And blue is what is remaining after all the non-blue colors are reflected. So if you put the blue and the red together, then all they're all reflected. But one re reflects all but red, one reflects all but blue. So the, uh, the, the transmission of light will be zero. You'll get neither blue nor red coming through. And mm -hmm. so in this way, Newton's model of light as a white light consisting of color, of a mixture of colors, becomes a brilliant explanation of a whole range of phenomena. A whole range. And then the, the other remarkable thing is, here we are 350 years later, it's still true. Not that we haven't changed our mind about light. You know, wrong about many things about light. But this model that he gives of the um, white light being a um, mixture of colors is still pretty much what we think. I want to, in the last, um, you know, few minutes here, I, at least, I, 
I'd like to ask a question about um, some of the positive things that this, um, that I, not just Baker's philosophy, but the philosophy you've written throughout the book here, where it adds back into the world of science and philosophy. And one of the things that you mention quite a few times is the distinction between philosophers and scientists. And this hap- you give a wonderful history of this as well, a history I was, I was completely unaware of. Um, and you push back on this quite heavily for a number of reasons, which I'll, which I'll get you to explain. But it also goes into uh, not just the history of Bacon and and his history uh, and and his and the impact of his philosophy as well, but the question of um, of the success, the radical success of science, because there's a history here of a lot of philosophers, people like Feyerabend doing a lot of effort to push back and say there, there, there is no method to science. And um, you write that for a number of years, uh, for centuries, what actually happened was scientists were dramatically su- successful. But because of this distinction between philosophers and scientists, um, a lot of what they were doing wasn't being written down as method. It was being passed on through master to apprentice, so to speak. And so it was lost. Yes. My thesis uh, altogether, excuse me. My thesis is fourfold. First, Francis Bacon gave us a new method, which is intriguing and seems to have possibilities. Second, that it was applied and applied successfully by Newton. Third, that this successful uh, use was then spread through the sciences. What uh, what Newton did with gravity than other people did. Coulomb did with electricity, for instance, and the theory of heat, then in the theory of light, and then so all the different subjects got models. Now, all this time in the 18th and 19th and uh, early part of the 19th centuries, when people were producing these models, they were producing models, each of which was a Baconian schematism. It works extremely well in the limited area. But of course, it may or may not fit with the other models. This is exactly the way Bacon envisaged it. But when you have 10 or 12 or 15 models, all of which are knowledge, they all have this property of being the only possible way of explaining a limited set of facts, a very uh, limited set of discrepant facts. Uh, Every time you try and explain it by some other model, one discrepancy to the other refutes it. So everything is refuted except the thing that you have. When you have multiple ways, then uh, two things happen and they're independent of one another. One of these is that the models are inconsistent regarding some fundamental property And so you have uh, scientists or philosophers, natural philosophers, trying to find ways of reconciling them. So if you have uh, uh, difficulty, then you can have theoreticians trying to solve it. The other thing that happens, which is remarkable and no, no one seems to have noticed it in the history of science amongst philosophers, is that these models that you have start borrowing from each other uh, details about the world. So if, you, if you're if you a chemist, you can use what people discover in electricity, uh, something fact, and use it in your investigations of a chemical phenomenon, phenomenon. Similarly, a physicist might use something that a chemist describes. Somebody who describe, discovers heat uh, studying heat might use something which somebody else describes in mechanics. And so you get in the early 19th century, a collection of models which have what I call a certain density of scientific knowledge. They're dense, mm-hmm. they use each other. And because they're convinced that this is knowledge, they have no trouble assuming that the other person is right. There's a people in science accept that other scientists also discover things. And they use them. And this density of science in in the early 1830s or 1840s began to be noticeable because they also gave you remarkable uh, powers of a nature which people used in their everyday life. You know, the steam engine and 
the uh, telegraph, uh, you know, all the inventions which were applied, not only gave scientists satisfaction that they are getting somewhere, but so did non-scientists. Now, the word scientist was not in use until then. Mm. It was invented by Huell. And he invented it because this kind of model building in which you borrow from a collection of belia, uh, uh, collection of models that all appear to be known to you. I mean, we know that they're only approximately right, but you're getting at something in reality. And this gives us a collection of uh, models that distinguished science from the rest of philosophy. Until then, everybody who worked in these areas called themselves natural philosophers, like Lavoisier or Priestley or Young or you know any of these uh, uh, contri contributor Faraday called them a natural philosopher. Mm. But once these models come together, it looks like they're qualitatively different from what the natural philosophers of old were doing. Because they didn't have, apparently, this confidence that another person's work would be borrowed as easily. And so this kind of activity came to be regarded as a very special kind of thing. Now, my view is it's still natural philosophy. But because it has this density of scientific knowledge, it appears different. And so the question arises, how is this kind of activity different from the old metaphysical activity that say Aristotle or Democritus did. How yeah. look different? And that becomes the problem that people start working on in the, and the interest proper, for example, the demarcation problem is just that. But it assumes that there is an essential difference between modern science and modern metaphysics. And my view is that there's no essential difference. It's not a difference in essence. It's just a difference in success. The use of the skeptical model of induction that was proposed by Francis Bacon and modified from time to time has been so successful that it has given us a collection of models which looks qualitatively different from philosophy. But it's still philosophy. It's just done very well. Just to help clarify here for listeners as well, I, I'm assuming you're also, through what you're saying there, I'm guessing you're, you're um, saying that um, Francis Bacon's philosophy also helps to explain um, uh, the um, not just uh, what how technology arises, how techno science happens. Well, yes, this uh, technology is a very big field, a very old field. I mean, there when uh, technology is used for centuries before modern science. But what happens with modern science? is that it rapidly produces improvements in our technology wherever it touches it. Not everywhere, but wherever it touches it. And so uh, science came to be seen in the 19th century almost as the fount of technology, even though it isn't. So, you know, there's lots in technology. Engineers have to work with the real world in all aspects, not just in those aspects with, in which science describes it. But after the end of the 19th century, it became clear to all engineers that they can't ignore what science tells them because, uh, first of all, it gives us improved technologies, whatever technology we had can be improved by them. And secondly, it's constantly improving itself with its descriptions. So you find lots of uh, polytechnics and institutes of technologies today, which didn't exist in the 19th century. Engineers started to take a real interest in what the products of science are. And they're still, you might say, um, interested in following up because the products of science are constantly improving in little bits of technology, even though I'm not saying that technology is merely a product of science. By the way, I don't talk about all this in my first book. Mm. This is, this I, uh, I talk about Francis Bacon's account of science, his theory of method. And I talk about how it's applied in, and uh, in Isaac Newton's doctrine and how it was modified to take account of the developments of Galileo's and Descartes' theories of science. But I don't go into the general understanding. For that, you'll have to wait until I produce my um, sequel to this book, which is called uh, Isaac Newton's 
well, currently I call it Isaac Newton's uh, experimental astronomy with the subtitle and the curious disappearance of scientific method from methodology. And I show how it disappears and all of philosophy of science now looks enigmatic to us. Well, give us a give us a bit more of a teaser into your next book then, because um, there's this history of Bacon here, which, um, as you mentioned earlier, um, um, he he comes along, he produces this philosophy. He doesn't have many followers during his life, but at some point, he his method is adopted by the Royal Society, and um, and then it is associated with Newton in certain ways, this experimental philosophy. But it is incredibly controversial. And I'm assuming a lot of this, especially his his, his work on physics and planetary orbits, um, and people say no, New Newton couldn't possibly have used uh, Baconian induction and all these methods. And it's this great um, controversy or at least discussion within the history of science. I'm assuming many, much of this is in your next book. So, um, how how much of that is there? And uh, I might get a give a bit more of a teaser to your next book because it, it is. It, it, I'm assuming it is going to be a, a a follow up to this book and. This book does give a lot of teasers towards it at certain points as well. Well, let me, uh, this is the main difficulty uh, of understand, explaining what Bacon's theory is. Early on in my writing, I could not get people to accept my interpretation of Bacon because they assumed a theory of skepticism, which I didn't, uh, I, and there are many forms of skepticism and most philosophers think there's just one thing and they said, Bacon doesn't do that. And they wouldn't, ex many of them didn't see how it could apply to science, which I tried to explain in this book. But the third question, how is it that if it was so successful, was it forgotten? Mm. And for this, my answer is as follows, and I'll put it in a very broad way. There was in the 17th century, a fundamental question about uh, what you might call, you know, about uh, religious faiths. There were multiple faiths and uh, they were quarreling with one another. There were many wars in Europe and there were many wars, uh, civil war in uh, England too. And the question of who should rule was closely tied with it. Uh, and my suggestion is that this problem about uh, understanding of um, what is the how to uh, live a good life was also studied by people in a secular way, in particular by uh, Hobbes and by the Cambridge Platonists. And they ran into trouble. They couldn't solve the problem. And then eventually John Locke comes and solves it by suggesting that the difference between knowledge and faith is that knowledge is based on empirical facts on sensory impressions, ultimately, on the simple um, ideas of perception. Whereas the claims we make in uh, religion are those which cannot be established by an empirical method. And this gives him a way of suggesting liberal democracy, which is seen all through Europe and even today as a great solution to the otherwise endemic problem of fighting between sects, between Christian sects, between Christian Muslims, or between um, different groups, different religions, it gives a solution, which is that if we disagree on issues on which we don't have secular knowledge, we must agree to disagree and respect each other. You may be right about your view, I may be right, mistaken about mine, but it doesn't matter. We're not going to find out anyway. So we live with each other on a sort of kind of compromise. I call this the Pax Empirica. The empirical pack, uh, fact is that those things which are secular knowledge can be established by, he thinks, reduction to the empirical facts. And if you reduce everything to empirical facts, to a foundation, then in that foundation, all of Bacon's recipes disappear. If a foundational view can't accommodate the kind of skepticism that Bacon proposes. So it becomes uh, like a, a, a legitimizing uh, principle 
that you can only talk about how we know science, how we know facts, by appealing to some form of empiricism. And all the forms of empiricism, there are many of them, rule out the Baconian method. And so the method disappears from methodology. We can no longer say it in a way that respects, you might say, our a solution to the much more serious problem of a liberal democracy. That's and, my solution to the second book. Mm. And um, I, I have to assume that it must be incredibly frustrating for you or some people reading this. I remember reading, I'm not sure if it's in this book or in one of the earlier discussions where you said that despite all of that, for much of the history, um, and this is a mistake Popper made about uh, bacon and I, 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 I suppose this might be the last question there as well. Um, um, Popper equated the work of of uh, Bacon with the work of Locke as well. So despite that um, that problem and, and and that distinction, Popper s simply alluded that the two should stick together and that they are one is a predecessor to the other. And I think you indicated that in, in, it should it should be the other way around. In fact, Bacon is more of a predecessor to Popper at one point here, but. What is the mistake that scholars are making here? So Popper made a big mistake. Other, other people have made the similar mistake over the years. Um, I think at one point you alluded to the fact that they're not going back to Bacon's original work and reading it itself. So um, I could be wrong about that, of course, so please let, let, let me know. But what is the mistake that's been made out there that so many, so many people have got Bacon so wrong over the years? The people have assumed that he's not, uh, Popper's not the first. Popper is simply reflecting uh, the general opinion that Francis Bacon proposed empiricism all the way through the 19th century and most of the latter half of the 18th century. Francis Bacon was described as an empiricist. And you, if you look at the history of the subject, um, you'll find that. Um, in the 17th century, people talked about the experimental method a lot. By the end of the 18th century, people only talk about empiricism because they assume that experimental uh, method is, is fundamentally empiricist. The fundamental difference between the two is that exper the experimental method is skeptical, not foundational. You start with the foundation and you question it. And it's out of the questions and the discrepancies that you extract your general principles. Because you, uh, the way I described it. And yet the, everyone made the mistake, though. They all made the mistake of thinking that, um, that Bacon was an empiricist. Yes. And the reason is that late in the 17th century, when Locke's theory came up and Newton's Principia was written within a couple of years of each other, and there was the great uh, um, takeover of England by the Dutch royal family, which is called the Glorious Revolution, right? All this happens within two or three years. And Newton himself was a great mathematician and very clear in writing his mathematics, was not just so clear writing about his own methodology. He was very clipped. He wrote in a limited way. He was not sure what he was saying. His theory of knowledge is not... He had a good sense of it, but he wouldn't write about it. He eventually capitulated and admitted that some things that, uh, that Locke said may be true. And gradually it came to be thought that the Newtonian method was an example of an application of Locke's empiricism. And that was a disaster for methodologists, but not for anyone else. Scientists continue doing science. So the word scientist, of course, is 19th century. Natural philosophers in those days continued doing whatever they were doing, and they were doing it well. And they developed all these great theories of electricity and magnetism and heat and light and so on. But in this development, the description of method had to be empiricist because it was the holy grail of peace. You know, the Pax Empirica brought peace, but it didn't quite bring peace because uh, the Irish question remained in England. Mm. And that, so, But there was the promise of peace. And many parts of Europe, 
even if they did not accept uh, other English doctrines, they accepted that this way of uh, dividing knowledge into secular knowledge, which we have publicly, and the things that we believe privately should be a matter of faith, which we rely upon, was widely accepted among intellectuals as a great solution. So Locke was the great story. And my general description of it is that when the sun of, when, you know, like when the sun shines, the stars become invisible. And that's roughly what I see happened in the 17th, late in the 17th century, is that Newton had a very good method, which he had developed uh, by modifying Robert Boyle and Bacon. But that method was just a star, and the sun was Locke's solution to the problem of religious conflict in liberal democracy. And so once you adopt liberal democracy and his way of delimiting what is knowledgeable, what we can know in a secular or public way as based on empiricism, it becomes clear that all of science consists of hypotheses, guesses. And that's where we're stuck. We can't understand why science is successful until we divorce experimentalism from empiricism. Now, um, that is a great place to end the podcast on as well. Now, the book we've been speaking about today is Francis Bacon's Skeptical Recipes for New Knowledge. I'll link it below. And as I said before, I've read it twice. It's it's wonderful. It goes beyond Bacon. It goes into Jagdish's philosophy. It goes into um, a lot of the history that Jagdish uh, connects to Bacon, which is really wonderful and, and I found incredibly insightful. So I'm going to link it below and I can't encourage it enough. And Jagdish, when your new book does come out, um, we must chat again. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Bye-bye.